Dr. Ashner is a senior researcher at the Kennedy Center of Research on Human Development at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Ashner is currently the endowed Gray E.B. Stallman Professor of Neuroscience and the Director of the Division of Pediatric Toxicology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Ashner's research interests are in the neurobiology and physiology of astrocytes and the mechanisms of central nervous system injury. He has been particularly interested in metal uptake and distribution in the brain, devoting his research to the mechanisms of transport of methylmercury, manganese, and uranium across the endothelium, composing the blood-brain barrier, as well as their cellular and molecular me mechanisms of neurotoxicity. Dr. Ashner has served on numerous national and international toxicology panels, Institute of Medicine, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Center for Disease Control, Agency, uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, just to name a few. Also chaired the Alcohol and Toxicology 3 National Institute of Health study section and has authored over 250 peer-reviewed manuscripts and chapters in the area of neurotoxicology. Let's give a real welcome to Dr. Ashner. What I'll do today is talk to you about uh, mercury in neurological diseases. Uh, I decided actually not to talk about manganese because I think it's not applicable to uh, dental practice. What I decided to do is give you a, a, an overview of the mercury. So what I'll do today is I'll talk to you about the different forms of mercury. And I think you're familiar uh, with them and uh, Dr. Chang mentioned them uh, earlier today. There are different, different species and the different species of mercury don't tend to behave the same way. Uh, the one that you're mostly concerned with is obviously metallic mercury or the mercury vapor uh, from the surface of the amalgams, uh, which, as all of you know, affects mainly the central nervous system. There's a mercuric mercury, where mercury is in the divalent form. It has been used in the past uh, in uh, various uh, medicinal applications. It's a very potent inhibitor of the uh, sodium transport along the membrane, and one of the drugs that was used before is known as Mersolil, which was a, a diuretic. Uh, it simply blocks the uptake of sodium across uh, the kidney, so you'll have more sodium in the urine, and that carries out, obviously, more water. So it was a very potent uh, diuretic. Uh, inorganic mercury affects mainly the kidney. Uh, there's also monovalent mercury, which is mercurous mercury, which was used in a calomel. It has very little toxicity due to limited oral absorption. And uh, the one uh, that's of interest our days as well, other than the mercury vapor, is organic mercury. Uh, the first one is methylmercury, and I'll show you a movie. And you'll be able to see what happens under conditions where one is exposed to very high levels of methylmercury. The target organ for methylmercury is the CNS, the central nervous system. We have phenylmercury, uh, which is a much longer chain carbon compound of the organic mercury, and uh, given its, the, the long alkyl chain that it has, it tends to behave much more like inorganic mercury. So in the liver, the phenyl is broken away from the mercury, and you get mercury, which is essentially inorganic, and then uh, that inorganic uh, primarily affects actually uh, the, the kidney with some effect in the central nervous system. And the one that I already mentioned is ethyl mercury, and ma many of you know a uh, thimerosal salt, which uh, contains 50% by volume ethyl mercury. Uh, this is the compound that's used as uh, preservative in vaccines, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. This is just to uh, refresh your memory in terms of the global cycle of mercury. Uh, there's obviously mercury in the Earth crust. It tends to evaporate. Uh, most of the mercury in the environment actually is man-made. It's anthropogenic. Uh, we tend to burn coal. Uh, it also is being spewed out from uh, volcanoes and, and other uh, sources. It travels very long distance in the atmosphere. The mercury, the metallic mercury, can get uh, oxidized to mercury 2 plus. Then it tends to sediment in the waterways. And I'll have another slide. I'll show you exactly what happens there. Uh, in general, the concentrations of mercury in the environment have gone up over the last few decades, uh, and this is just a historical uh, overview looking at the increase in mercury in various uh, fish-eating birds. What you have on the y-axis is mercury 
in the feathers of two different types of birds, and you can see it takes us back all, uh, it takes, takes us back to 1840, all the way to 1965, and I think you can appreciate that as the world became more and more industrialized, the levels of mercury in these birds uh, have increased. In general, uh, this is trivial, but in general also, there's more mercury in the northern hemisphere, and that reflects the fact that the northern hemisphere is much more industrialized compared to the, to the southern hemisphere. So there's plenty of mercury in the environment. Uh, once mercury uh, sediments uh, in the water, uh, what tends to happen is that uh, the, inner, the, the mercury in the sediments in the divalent form, uh, the mercuric mercury, uh, gets methylated. There are specific bacteria uh, in the sediments that have the ability as a protective mechanism to stick a methyl group on the inorganic mercury. That forms the methyl mercury. That gets then into the fish. And, as, uh, and fish represent the major source of intake for uh, methyl mercury, especially in, fish, in those individuals that rely on protein derived from fish for their ma major dietary, dietary source. And I'll get back to it uh, later. Uh, Dr. Chang mentioned that before as well. Uh, it's important to appreciate that different forms of methylmercury can get uh, biomethylated and demethylated, and they can move around uh, what's going to be inorganic mercury. It does not necessarily have to stay that way, and vice versa. The methylmercury can get detoxified to form inorganic mercury, et cetera. And, and I'll touch upon that a little bit more uh, as I go uh, further in my lecture. Now this is just to give you some uh, appreciation for the concentrations of mercury in various uh, uh, fish, and these are fish that we like to eat, uh, tilefish, swordfish, king mackerel, and shark. And I'm sure, as you all know, uh, the, the FDA uh, has a fish advisory and recommendation that pregnant women and the children until the age of six actually avoid eating any of these uh, four types of fish. Now the current issues, uh, or the three faces of mercury, as my mentor used to uh, like to call it, uh, Tom Clarkson, are uh, thimerosal, which is a preservative and vaccine. And I'll start uh, with thimerosal. I'll move on and talk to you about methylmercury. And I'll finish with mercury uh, derived from amalgam, uh, giving you sort of an overview of where we stand now and uh, what my belief is in terms of where the research needs are uh, and what should be done next. Uh, and this is a very broad overview. Uh, I won't go into too many, uh, too many details. Uh, first of all, uh, these are the major clinical toxicological features of mercury. And what you can see here is uh, different variables, and I think you have it in front of you so you can probably read it, and the different species of mercury. And this is just to rehash what I've said before, is and that is the different forms of mercury have affinity for different tissues and they will cause damage in different parts of the body. So if we look at mercury vapor, for example, uh, the way we obviously get it into the body is by way of inhalation. It tends to accumulate mostly in the central nervous system and I'll talk about it later as to why this happens as well as in the kidney. Uh, it can uh, cause uh, bronchial irritation, uh, pneumonitis, uh, gastrointestinal effects, and, and I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, you can see essentially that for every mercury uh, compound, there is a distinct uh, way by which it is absorbed into the body, whether inhalation or oral. It tends to accumulate in specific tissues, and that the symptoms tend to be different. Inorganic mercury, for example, is accumulated uh, in the body by way of uh, oral consumption. It does not get into the brain. It affects primarily the kidney. Uh, it has some gastrointestinal effects. Methylmercury, on the other hand, uh, the major target tissue is the brain because it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it can cause paresthesia, ataxia, visual and hearing loss, and it very much actually depends on the age in which an individual is exposed to uh, methylmercury. Ethylmercury is uh, the preservative, or thimerosal, which contains ethylmercury, is a preservative in vaccines. Uh, it also tends to accumulate in the central nervous system. It's another organic form uh, of mercury, uh, but it has also effects in the kidney, unlike uh, methylmercury, because similar to phenylmercury, it's a longer chain uh, carbon mercury compound, so it tends to be cleaved in the liver, and therefore a higher ratio of the ethylmercury is converted into the inorganic form of, of mercury.
So I'll start with uh, thimerosal cell and vaccines. Uh, where, where do we stand right now? Uh, there have been a number of uh, epidemiological studies, uh, and I'm not going to go into all these studies, and I know you've heard uh, from some of these speakers before. Uh, the data are contradicting, uh, but the majority of the studies suggest that thimerosal uh, does not, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, is not related to autistic uh, spectrum disorder, and I'll give you some, some of the reasons for that. Uh, there have been both retrospective, there have been uh, prospective studies, there have been ecological studies. Uh, perhaps one of the best studies that has been ever conducted was uh, conducted in Denmark, where they were wise enough and uh, preceded us in taking thimerosal out of vaccines. That's been done about 12 years ago. They've been looking at the rate of autism since, and you'd expect that if it was thimerosal that caused the autism, that you'd see a drop in the frequency of autism in Denmark and you don't see any change. If anything, it keeps going up. So that's a pretty good argument that thimerosal probably does not have very much to do with, with, with autism. There have been some studies, and I know you've heard from, uh, from the guyers before, uh, on the other side, on the other hand, uh, that have been associated with, uh, where, where thimerosal has been shown to be associated with, uh, with the frequency of autism. Now, in my opinion, there's really only one way where you can study this, and unfortunately, we don't have the money to do that, and probably we don't have the statistical power to do that. What, what's been done to date is essentially to look at non-autistic kids and to look at autis autistic kids, and then ask the question, what is the rate of vaccination or the administration of MMR vaccine, which has also been implicated in, uh, in autism, and ask the question, if the rate of the vaccination or administration of MMR vaccine is higher in autistic kids versus non-autistic kids. That's been done, and actually there are no differences. There's a couple studies that have been published on this, and they're referenced here. The only way that we're going to be able to answer the question is to do the opposite experiment, and that is to look at the rate of autism and then ask ourselves how many of these kids were vaccinated and how many of these kids were not vaccinated. And that's not feasible at, these, at this point of time. One of the reasons is because the prevalence of autism is, as high as it is, it's still relatively low when you talk about statistical means of, of looking at, at it. It's about estimated to be at 1 to 150. Uh, in order to get the power for the testing, you need thousands and thousands of kids. And uh, it's, it's just not feasible to do it. And the other way of asking the question is uh, to, to look and ask whether the prevalence is uh, low and whether the rates of the vaccinated kids is even lower still in kids that are unvaccinated. And there are not very many kids in the United States that are not vaccinated with these vaccines, so it's very difficult to, to get to this population. Uh, but this, in my opinion, is really the study that needs to be done, and I think it will be the most definitive in terms of uh, showing an association or, or a correlation between autism and, uh, and the vaccines. Now, there are big differences between methylmercury and ethylmercury. Uh, decomposition, uh, or decomposition is a detoxification process for CNS toxicity, and both methylmercury and ethylmercury tend to get uh, demethylated or deethylated. That is, there is production of inorganic mercury from both of these. But the rate of decomposition of ethylmercury to inorganic mercury is much faster than that of methylmercury. The other thing is that the passage through the blood-brain barrier favors very small molecules, and ethylmercury is bigger. That is not to say that ethylmercury does not get into the brain. We, we know actually very well that it does get into the brain, and I'll show you some of these studies. We, we also don't know how it gets into the brain, although some of the studies that we're involved right now suggest that it might be very much the same mechanism as the mechanism that transports methylmercury, and I'll show you that uh, a little bit later. What we also know is that mercury clears much faster after it's administered as ethylmercury. That's been done in both in uh, non-human pr primates, in monkeys, and it's been done in uh, other animal species, in, in, uh, in uh, rats, for example. And because the metabolic rate, which essentially is the basic metabolism, the rates of loss from the body burden, are related to what's known as the fractional power of the body weight, or uh, what's known as the allometric relationship, mer mercury clears much faster uh, from infants. Uh, 
This all means that you cannot extrapolate from methylmercury and conclude from methylmercury that everything that's applicable to the methylmercury will also be applicable to the ethylmercury. And if you do that, what you're doing is you're underestimating the safe exposure range for ethylmercury because of all these various points that I've, I've alluded to. So you have to deal with those two compounds in a very different way and extrapolating from one to the other, uh, in my opinion, is not the right way to go about it. Now some of the studies that I've mentioned uh, have been done and published very recently in the in, in environmental health perspective. This is a study conducted by uh, Tom Barbacker, and some of you may be familiar with it. And what it, what it does, it actually shows a couple points. Uh, look at the blood total mercury, and this is, done, this is after injecting monkeys giving them four oral doses of, of methylmercury. Uh, what you can see is first look at the y-axis and look at the numbers, 10, 20, 30, 40, because in the next slide the numbers are going to be lowered. Uh, this is the time course. So the animals are given methylmercury four times, and you can see that after every time that the animal is given methylmercury, you let one week go by. Uh, the level of mercury after one week does not come back to the baseline. After two weeks, it does not come back to the level of the first week. There's an additive effect in such a way that the baseline goes from a little bit above zero to almost 40 nanograms per ml. And the predicted and the observed uh, values are essentially uh, the same. So this is for methylmercury. If you do the same thing for ethylmercury, so this is four injections, weekly injections, mimicking essentially uh, what an infant would receive uh, if uh, he or she were to uh, be administered the vaccines with the thimerosal. So what you see is that after the initial injection you get a sharp increase, but it's much, much lower. It's about three times lower than with methylmercury. You also see that after one week the levels of mercury go back almost to baseline in such a way that the additive effect, if there is any, is certainly much, much lower than the one that I've shown you in the previous slide. So the, the thimerosal uh, injected vaccines are about, he, uh, monkeys are about here compared to the methylmercury injected animals, which as you can see, there, there's a very pronounced uh, additive effect. Uh, also, if you look at the washout of total mercury in the blood and in the brain, what you find is that these two compounds have very different behaviors. These are the same animals, and what you're looking at panel A is what happens uh, after the last dose, so these animals received four injections of methylmercury and then we are looking at them over time. These are the concentrations of uh, mercury in nanograms uh, per ml or nanograms per gram for blood and brain. This is the methylmercury and these are the four injections of the thimerosal. And I think what you can appreciate is uh, first of all that the numbers for methylmercury are higher, that is and the second thing is that the, the shape of the curve is different than the one that you see for the ethylmercury. What we're looking here at is the washout of total mercury. So we're looking at the half-life or how, what, what's the, the time for half of the amount of the mercury to be washed out of the body. And this is much flatter than, than this and this is much flatter compared to this. And this essentially means that the half-life of methylmercury is much longer in the body compared to the half-life of inorganic mercury. That is, the half-life of methylmercury is about 59, 60 days uh, in the brain. The half-life of inorganic mercury in the brain is much shorter. It's about 24 days. The half-life of methylmercury in the blood uh, is about uh, 19 days, I believe. Yeah, 19 days. And the half-life of ethylmercury or the thimerosal in, uh, in the monkeys is in the order of seven days. So these two compounds behave very differently. If you also look at the washout of the organic and the inorganic mercury uh, from the brain, uh, essentially the same type of information, concentrations of mercury, A is methylmercury, B is ethylmercury, time after the last dose, you see that the methylmercury in the brain tends to uh, stick around much longer. This is the organic mercury and the half-life is about 60 days. The inorganic uh, the amount is actually lower than in the thimerosal given animals, uh, and I'll point that out in the next slide. And uh, the half-life is about, uh, it's not here, but it's very similar to what you see for the ethylmercury. It's in the order of about 14 days. 
And you can see that the washout of ethyl mercury is much, much faster. It's in the order of about 14 days. And just like with the mercury, the inorganic mercury seems to be trapped in the brain in such a way that it's not cleared from the brain very quickly. So the conclusions from this study are that the initial and terminal half-life of mercury in blood following thimerosal cell exposure are 2.1 and 8.6 days. And these are significantly shorter than the elimination or half-life of methylmercury, which is uh, 3 to 10 times longer compared to the ethylmercury. As I pointed out, the brain concentration of total mercury are significantly higher in the animals uh, that are, are given methylmercury. But the concentrations of inorganic mercury are actually higher in the animals that have uh, been administered the thimerosal. There's about threefold difference. So after giving the thimerosal, there's actually more inorganic mercury in the brain, though the total amount of mercury is much, much lower. There's a higher percentage of total mercury in the brain in the form of inorganic mercury after the administration of the thimerosal. And the current study indicates that methylmercury, as I've emphasized before, is not a suitable reference for risk assessment for exposure to thimerosal-derived mercury. You have to look specifically at the data that are derived from uh, thimerosal-treated animals. The second compound that I'll talk about is, is methylmercury. And I've already described the, the cycle, the atmospheric cycle, so there's no sense for me to go over it again. Uh, but I want to share with you a movie that was actually given to me by my uh, postdoctoral advisor who was uh, involved in uh, studies in Iraq in the early 70s, and Tori Siversen, who is a mercury investigator in, uh, at the University of Trondheim in, in Norway. This was a 16 millimeter film, and uh, somehow they were able to get it into uh, to PowerPoint. So this is a poisoning that occurred late in the 60s and early in the 70s, where grain from Mexico that contained methylmercury was shipped to Iraq. Uh, it arrived there much too late for the planting season. And what the Iraqi farmers decided to do was to, uh, instead of planting it, they decided to use it for their traditional bread, the pita bread that, that uh, they're using. And the previous uh, few clips showed the, the baking of the traditional bread. Uh, what you see here is a child that has been exposed to uh, methylmercury. Uh, I think first you'll notice that this is not autism. This child has very significant problems with uh, motor and, and sensory uh, input and output. Uh, this child has uh, probably a piece of bread or, or candy, and, and you can see he's trying to put it in his mouth, and it falls down, actually. Uh, you could see that the child is very spastic and suffers from uh, dystonia. Uh, here again, uh, it's the same child. He's trying to pick up a piece of food and put it in his mouth. Uh, you can see the, the, the spastic digits, uh, the spastic uh, palm of his hand. Uh, he has tremendous difficulties in coordination. Uh, you, you can appreciate it for the movie. These kids have problems with uh, uh, their speech. They can't articulate very well. Uh, this is another child. Uh, and this syndrome, actually, the methylmercury syndrome, is, is much, more much more similar to, uh, to cerebral palsy than, than to autism, which brings me back to the fact that you really cannot compare it between uh, those two. That methylmercury is poisonous, uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, there have been a number of studies. Uh, I think we need to preface it, though, by saying that methylmercury toxicity also depends on the dose. There have been prenatal exposures uh, to mercury or methylmercury from maternal fish consumption. And this has been shown uh, in a number of studies to be associated with reduced performance on a number of tests of neurological function, cognitive development, attention, and behavior, and uh, motor skills. Uh, the National Research Council Committee uh, concluded that neurodevelopmental deficits are the most sensitive, well-documented effects of exposure to methylmercury. And the same committee in uh, 2000 uh, based its uh, findings on a number of uh, epidemiological studies. A couple of them are still going on, one of them in the Faroe Islands and the other one in the Seychelles Islands. These are two areas where the populations are consuming fish essentially uh, three times a day. These are very small populations. They're very easy to study. And th they've been followed now for, uh, at least in the case of the Seychelles Islands, for about 12 or 13 years. 
Now, the studies measured uh, prenatal exposure and neurodevelopment or neurodevelopmental endpoints. Uh, though there were differences in the tests uh, used to measure potential deficits, the Faroe Island study and the New Zealand Island, uh, the New Zealand uh, study have found a statistically significant relationship between uh, prenatal uh, methylmercury exposure and poor scores on tests of uh, neurologic function, but the Seychelles uh, study did not find the same uh, kinds of neurocognitive uh, deficits. So what's happening now is that the NIH decided to standardize the tests uh, that are conducted in the Seychelles and in the Faroe Islands, uh, hoping that they can eliminate some of the confounding variables and uh, show uh, or, or derive a, a more definitive answer uh, to uh, this issue. And it should be remembered that these, these kids, although they consume a quite a bit of methylmercury, these concentrations are, are relatively low compared to what you've seen in uh, the previous slides that I've shown you, or the movie that I've shown you from Iraq. Now, the guidelines for exposure to methylmercury have been developed by uh, various agencies, and they're, they're very different because they serve different purposes. I won't go into it. Uh, but these exposure levels are uh, 0.1 micrograms per kilogram uh, per body weight for the EPA, and the WHO actually has a level that's about five times higher. It's 0.47 micrograms per kilogram uh, per body weight. And if, if somebody eats tuna, uh, probably on a daily basis, uh, he or she will, will greatly exceed both this level and, and this level. Now, a little bit of the, the biochemistry that's associated with methylmercury. Uh, this is some work that we've done many, many years ago when I was a postdoc in Dr. Clarkson's lab. Uh, what we have shown is that the methylmercury, which is the CAJ3G, uh, like many of the other mercury compounds, it has a tremendous affinity for uh, sulfhydryl groups. Uh, Dr. Haley talked about it. Uh, the methylmercury will bind to cysteine, which is a neutral amino, which is a neutral amino acid in the body. Uh, it will form a complex, the methylmercury cysteine complex, which is shown here. And if you look at this complex and you compare it to uh, methionine, you can see that these two share a very similar structure. So essentially what happens is that the methylmercury cysteine conjugate, because of its mimicry, what we call molecular mimicry of methionine, will bind to the methionine transporter. And this is the way by which it can essentially fool different membranes and get transported or translocated from the blood into the different tissues. Uh, you could do also experiments to show that if you take methylmercury and you conjugate it with L-cysteine, which is the essential enantiomorph of, of uh, this amino acid, uh, you look at the uptake, uh, these are the open boxes, you see that within a few seconds you get a tremendous uh, uptake of the methylmercury cysteine uh, conjugate into, into the brain or into endothelial cells. If you do the same experiment where you conjugate methylmercury with D-cysteine, which is a non-essential enantiomorph, and it does not uh, readily get across the blood-brain barrier, you pretty much get a flat line. You can also do the experiment with methylmercury that's conjugated to L-cysteine, and instead of doing it at 37 degrees uh, Celsius, if you do it at 4 degrees Celsius, you also get a very flat uptake, which shows you that the uptake is an active transport system and a temperature dependent system. So by manipulating various parameters, uh, you can show what the properties of this transporter are. You can also block this transport of methylmercury cysteine by giving animals excessive concentrations of, uh, of methionine, because the methionine then competes with the cysteine methylmercury complex. And there are various permutations that have been done uh, to show uh, that the cysteine methylmercury conjugate is readily transported, as I said, on, on the neutral amino acid transporter, which is also known as uh, LAT1. It's very likely that ethylmercury, uh, based on some preliminary studies that we have done, is also transported on the same kind of uh, transporter. It probably does not get as readily into the brain simply because a larger fraction of the ethylmercury gets cleaved in the liver so that the total amount of ethylmercury that's available for the transporter is significantly lower compared to methylmercury, which tends to stick around as methylmercury much longer. 
Now, the brain has different cell types, and, and I'm going to talk about this uh, very briefly. Uh, there are obviously the glia, what I call the Rodney danger fields of the brain, because they're, they're still looking for some respect, and the neurons, which, which everybody knows about. Uh, we, we've been doing a lot of work with the astrocytes, which are essentially the garbage disposal of the brain. Uh, and they tend to accumulate a lot of the metals, uh, much of the mercury, much of the manganese, uh, Dr. Needleman talked about the lead. Much of the lead tends to accumulate in the astrocytes. The reason for that is because the astrocytes are sitting on top of the capillaries. So everything that gets in across the capillaries essentially has to go in through the astrocytes to get into the neurons. Now the astrocytes are important and they can modulate the toxicity of methylmercury, ethylmercury very likely, although it's not been studied, certainly the toxicity of lead and many other uh, noxious substances. And this is shown in this slide. Uh, this is a study that was conducted in, uh, in vitro, uh, and I've adapted this from a study by Rosenberg and Eisenman that was conducted in 1989. Uh, the yellow cells are beautiful neurons, and the green ugly cell uh, is the astrocyte. And you can see that the astrocyte sits very closely to the neurons. Actually, in real life, in real brain, there's a lot more astrocytes than neurons. Now, if you look at the toxicity of uh, glutamate, which is an excitotoxin, which is affected by uh, methylmercury, what you find out is that if you do studies in cultures that have essentially no astrocytes, uh, you need very little glutamate to cause toxicity. What we're looking at here is cell numbers, and these are the concentrations of glutamate. So you can kill about 50% of the cells with as slow a concentration as one micromolar of glutamate. On the other hand, if your culture looks like this and you add glutamate to it, what the astrocytes will do is they'll mop up most of the glutamate, and therefore the concentrations of glutamate in the extracellular fluid are relatively low, and under those conditions, you need about 300, or you need about uh, anywhere, well, you need about 50 micromolar. I'm not sure I can see it uh, the right way, but you're probably around this point here. You need concentrations of uh, Actually, it's right here. You, instead of two micromolars of, of, meth, of, meth, of glutamate, you need 194 micromolar of uh, glutamate. So there's about tenfold difference in the toxicity of glutamate, which is dependent upon the presence of the astrocytes in the culture. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because you've been talking about uh, oxidative stress. Uh, maybe I should just emphasize that neurons depend on their ability to make glutathione on the astrocytes. If you take neurons, and this is the pathway, it's not so much important. Uh, essentially, you have oxidized cysteine that goes into uh, glutamyl cysteine, uh, an enzyme known here as gamma glutamyl cysteine synthetase, makes this dipeptide, then this binds to glycine, uh, glutamine, uh, glutathione synthetase makes the glutathione, and then it can come out. This all happens in the astrocyte, and in order to maintain the optimal uh, redox potential, the proper amounts of glutathione, the neuron has to depend on the ability of astrocytes to uh, supply various amino acids that make this tripeptide, the glutathione. So if you have injury to the astrocytes, that will translate also to lower glutathione levels within neurons. And I should also point out that astrocytes actually have concentrations of glutathione, which are orders of magnitude higher than the concentration in the neuron. So the neuron is much, much more sensitive to uh, oxidative stress compared to the glutathione, compared to the astrocytes, because the glutathione essentially have a very large sink of glutathione. So under normal conditions, if there's a lot of, uh, if, if there's a need for a lot of redox potential within the astrocytes, uh, they can readily accommodate it, whereas the neurons are going to be very susceptible because their concentrations of glutathione are very low. This is a, one slide, and like Dr. Needleman, it's probably about 20 years of work. Uh, and, and I'm not going to show you very much or, or tell you too many details about the specifics of, of the studies, but the purpose of this study is just, or the slide is just to show you that there are many cellular processes that are being affected by methylmercury. Uh, I talked about glutathione production, and as I mentioned, glutathione is composed of three different uh, amino acids. It's a tripeptide, uh, 
In astrocytes, the concentrations are in the millimolar range. It's made from uh, cysteine, uh, glutamate, and glutamyl. And mercury will inhibit specific transporters for uh, glutamate. They're known as GLAST or GLT1. These are specifically found on the astrocytes. Uh, methylmercury also inhibits uh, the uptake of cysteine, which is a component of glutathione. So you can see already that under conditions where there's too much mercury in the extracellular fluid, the cell is not going to make enough glutathione. The other part of the equation is that the methylmercury will also increase reactive oxygen species generation, and there are various mechanisms where this can happen. It can happen in the cytosol. It can happen uh, in, in the mitochondria. Uh, Methylmercury is also known to stimulate a cytosolic enzyme, which is known as phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2 activates arachidonic acid, which is a precursor to lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation is like a brush fire. Once you get the lipid peroxidation, it's a very uh, unhappy type of uh, molecule that's being generated. It's looking for friends, and as it's doing so, it's extracting electrons from neighboring proteins and DNA and other cellular constituents, and, and you get a brush fire. It just keeps going on and on and on, and it's very hard to, to deal with. So arachidonic acid, we'll call it lipid peroxidation. Actually, there are many, many studies with the various species of mercury that show that you can measure byproducts of lipid peroxidation, even in the urine. Uh, for example, one can measure isoprostanes. Uh, it's been done uh, in various cases of, uh, of mercury uh, poisoning. Arachidonic acid itself also inhibits the uptake or these transporters for glutamate. So you can see there is a lot of signaling from one molecule to another. And when you sum it all up, uh, essentially this cell is not functioning the way it's supposed to. It cannot remove the glutamate from the extracellular fluid. And unfortunately or fortunately, uh, the glutamate is a necessity for, for the neurons. Uh, it's also needed for glutathione metabolism. If the glutamate is not removed from this cleft, from the synapse between the neuron and the astrocyte, what it tends to do is activate amino acid transporters, excitatory amino acid transporters, and that causes a flux of calcium. This leads to changes within the neurons, and eventually the neuron dies. So by interfering with homeostatic function within the astrocyte, you get indirectly a dysfunctional neurons. And that's been very well shown for uh, for methylmercury. Now the last one, and some of you actually may know more about it th than I do, is, is mercury vapor. Uh, some facts about amalgams, uh, and if this is too redundant, uh, I apologize. Uh, there are about 190 million people in the U.S. that have amalgam restorations. These are all numbers. I don't know if there's uh, any newer statistics. And there are 70 million restorations that are placed annually. Uh, it was estimated uh, that about 40 metric tons of mercury were used in dental restorations in the U.S. in 1997. And again, you would know better if that's, if that's gone up or down. I, I don't know the answer. And the annual figure for industrially sourced mercury pollution deposited in the U.S., again, 1997, is in the order, uh, quite astonishing actually, 52 metric tons. Now, the total intake of uh, mercury from amalgams is about 5 to 9 micrograms per day. And uh, actually, when I talk about the research needs, uh, you, you may recall I had one slide on the amount of mercury in fish. And it, it's very similar, actually, to what you see in terms of mercury derived from amalgam. Uh, I think Dr. Needleman was asked about the interaction between lead and mercury. Uh, I think one needs to ask the question about the interaction between the different species of mercury, and that's not being done. What happens in fish eating populations, for example, or Americans who eat a lot of fish and also have a lot of amalgams in their mouth? Uh, we don't know the answer for that. Intake is dependent on both the number of amalgams or the fillings and the total surface area of the exposed amalgam. And it's estimated that uh, for every 10 amalgam surfaces, one would have an increase of about one microgram per liter in the urinary concentration of mercury. So that's, uh, that's roughly doubling the background concentrations of mercury in the urine. Again, uh, information that I'm sure you, you are familiar with, uh, mastication of certain foods, uh, nicotine as well, uh, in chewing gum, uh, are known to contribute to total intake of uh, mercury. 
and I referenced all these studies, so if anybody's interested, you could go back and, and look at them. Uh, the long-term uh, nicotine chewing gum will raise urinary concentrations close to occupational health limits, and these are about 25 to uh, 50 micrograms per liter. And the removal of amalgams filling may also cause temporary elevation in blood concentrations of, methyl, of, of mercury, since the process may transiently increase the amount of mercury. This may have changed over the last 10 years, I don't know, because you obviously have much better filters and, and ventilation systems. Now, uh, there are no current standards for safe levels of mercury exposure from dental amalgams. Uh, I don't have it in my research needs, but I think uh, that, that's one of the things that needs to be done. The standards for occupational exposure to inorganic mercury are 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, I'm sure it's been measured in dental clinics, and I, I don't know the levels. Uh, but it's 50 micrograms per cubic meter in air, and it's 50 micrograms per gram corrected for creatinine uh, in the urine. Urine mercury, two to four micrograms per liter concentration in people with amalgams are well below concentrations found in people that are occupationally exposed to mercury, as I mentioned, uh, 20 to, to 50. This is uh, reminiscent of the story that Dr. Needleman uh, told us earlier. Uh, I think we know a lot about this population here, uh, and I think there's much to be learned about what happens as the standards go down and as you decrease the concentration of mercury in blood, tissues, and, and, and in the urine. Now, a little bit about the biochemistry of uh, inorganic mercury or mercury vapor. Uh, mercury vapor is generated uh, from the amalgams, uh, I don't think I need to say that, in the oral cavity, which is part of the body. Uh, and then uh, it acts with the hydrogen peroxide. There is an enzyme uh, known as catalase, which uh, catalyzes this reaction to oxidize the inorganic mercury to form HG++. And then that travels in the GI tract. HG++ is not very well absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. So what goes in pretty much goes out. Uh, however, a mercury vapor, uh, the, the output from the lungs and from the heart, about 20% of it goes directly to the brain. And there is time that's needed to cause this reaction. You, you need a few seconds to oxidize uh, the mercury to AG++. Uh, or you need time to oxidize all the metallic mercury to AG++. The time that it takes the mercury or, or the, the ox oxygenated blood to, to move from the lung to the brain uh, is, is relatively fast, and therefore not all the mercury vapor or the metallic mercury gets oxidized. So you have also a part of the mercury uh, in the air going through the respiratory passage and it very readily crosses the, the alveolar uh, membranes of the lung because the inorganic mercury, the mercury, metallic mercury is essentially a gas, it's diffusible, and it very readily will cross membranes. And that's the main reason why mercury vapor gets into the brain, whereas inorganic mercury does not. This is, this is emphasized some more here. So if you look at the lung, and if we inhale mercury vapor, it readily crosses uh, through the lung, it gets into the blood. As I said, a very small part of it gets uh, oxidized to AG++, but some of it does not, and this is a fraction of mercury that's available then for transport into the brain. AG0 then gets oxidized to AG++. It's a similar mechanism that I've described before uh, for the blood or for the oral cavity. It requires hydrogen peroxide and catalase. There's actually some very interesting anecdotal studies that have been conducted in, in miners. It's been shown that mercury miners, when they go down in the mine, they like to drink. And, and they claim for, for decades that they felt much better when they were drinking alcohol. The reason for that is that both alcohol uh, and mercury vapor are substrates for the same enzyme, catalase. So if you have a lot of mercury, if, if you have a lot of alcohol on board, you're actually reducing the amount of mercury vapor that's oxidized into the Hg++. Now, um, the same process ha happens in uh, red, blood red blood cells, as I said, uh, but some of the mercury also gets uh, as a vapor into the liver, it gets into the kidney, and you can see it gets oxidized the same way as in the blood, it's in the brain, to form Ag++. A good example of a mercury vapor poison individual is, uh, is uh, the Mad Hatter. 
uh, Alice in Wonderland, I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with that. Uh, mercury vapor also gets very readily across the placenta. And essentially, once you get Ag++, as I've shown you for ethyl mercury, it has a relatively long half-life in the brain. So once it's in the brain, the clearance of inorganic mercury from the brain is relatively long. It takes quite a bit of time to get it out compared to the organic mercury species. So that's why inorganic mercury affects, in the form of mercury vapor, affects both the brain and the kidney. Uh, in the case of methylmercury, we obviously ingest it. It goes through the, through the GI tract very readily. It then goes through the liver. Methylmercury conjugates with glutathione, and then it's transported through the bile back to the feces. Actually, the only way that you can break this cycle, which is known as the enterohepatic cycle, is uh, by way of demethylating the, the methylmercury to the inorganic species uh, in the gut. And we all have bacteria, actually, that can do it. We, we have uh, bacteria in the gut that are uh, demethylators of the methylmercury. As I said before, the inorganic mercury is not very well absorbed. So the more of the methylmercury you demethylate, the more of it comes out in the feces. And, and there are actually other means where you could do it. Uh, you can give penobarbital, for example, which increases the delivery of methylmercury to the, to the GI tract via the bile. It's an inducer of uh, of bioflow from, from the liver uh, to, the, to the GI tract, and that accelerates the process, and more of the methylmercury gets demethylated. Actually, people who are taking antibiotics are not demethylating methylmercury very well, so it tends to stick in the body much longer because the floor of the gut is, uh, is lacking. So in terms of the adverse effects of, of mercury vapor, uh, I don't think there's any argument about the occupational exposures of mercury vapor. Uh, it's been shown, and again, the references are here, uh, the prevalence of uh, attenuated postural tremor, impaired coordination, positive Romberg sign, reduced distal sensation, uh, all of which are suggestive of peripheral neuropathy have been uh, shown in a number of cohorts that have been studied uh, upon exposure to high levels of, of mercury vapor. Uh, there have been no adverse clinical health effects associated with dental amalgams other uh, than localized mucosal reactions. These are the big studies that have been conducted that I've been able to find in the literature. There have been uh, no large studies that have uh, reported effects associated with amalgam fillings in the general populations. And there are a couple studies that some of you may know in Sweden, a uh, Swedish twin study. There was another study that was conducted in nuns. Uh, where they looked at uh, various cognitive functions in relationship to the amount of uh, amalgam surfaces that we, these uh, individuals had, and there was no correlation uh, between the number of the amalgams and between uh, the neurocognitive endpoints that they've looked at. There's also, uh, Dr. Needleman actually mentioned uh, Dr. Bellinger as one, as, as one of his colleagues in the lead studies. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this study. There's been a randomized control trial conducted by David, David Bellinger at uh, Harvard that looked at uh, 534 six to 10 year old uh, children. They were looked uh, for five years uh, using a battery of intelligent tests, achievement, language, memory, learning, visual, spa spatial skills, verbal fluency, fine motor function, problem solving, attention, and executive function. They were subdivided into different groups. Uh, again, you have the table. A number of restored surfaces in the mouth, number of restored amalgams, amalgam surfaces, the cumulative number of surfaces restored over the five years, and the cumulative numbers of surfaces restored with amalgam. There are obviously statistical differences in some of those, because some of them were, th were with the restoration material, some of them with uh, amalgams. And I'm not going to go into details, but essentially, what they found was that the kids with the amalgams obviously had higher levels of uh, uh, mercury in the urine, 0.9 versus 0.6 micrograms per gram. They had, uh, but there were a few significant differences between the test scores of the children in the two groups. There were not, no consistency in the direction of the effects, and they analyzed the data, use, uh, they analyzed the data in two different ways using two cumulative exposure indices, uh, one of them being the surface years of amalgam, and the other one, uh, the urinary mercury concentration, and these again produced similar results. 
exposure to mercury and amalgam at the levels experienced by these children, by these uh, children who participated in this trial, uh, did not, this is the conclusion, did not affect the neurophysiological function within the five year follow up. Uh, I think what's lacking in this study, uh, and this is one of my research needs, uh, is that this is relatively short time study. They've done it for five years, and the long term effects remain unknown. Uh, I can tell you with my studies with manganese that if you can, you can expose some animals to manganese for three weeks or a month or two months and you don't see anything, if you do it for six months, the data are going to be very different. So uh, mercury is not lead, and with lead you might be able to see the neurocognitive deficits very early on. Uh, it might be that with the methylmercury you need a much longer period of exposure, and the, the, the spectrum of the, the symptoms might not be present in early childhood. It may be something that may feed in uh, to some of the more sedentary diseases that we see. So I, I think the verdict is not out and, and we need to look at it much more carefully. Uh, now, I, I believe most of you are familiar with these studies as well. There have been very few studies uh, that have looked at uh, genetic predisposition uh, and, and neurocognitive functions in, in various dentists. And some of these studies have been uh, published. Uh, some of them are relatively new, uh, as late as uh, 2006 by Diane Echeverria at the University of Washington in Seattle. And these studies have shown that occupationally exposed dentists reported preclinical effects on symptoms, on mood, motor function uh, for a group whose urinary mercury concentrations averaged as low as 36 micrograms per mercury per liter. Uh, I shouldn't probably say as slow because these are, these are relatively high compared to the general population. But it, if nothing else, it suggests that if you're exposed to mercury actually in dental clinics, your urinary levels are, are going to be much higher than the population at large. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go into too many details, but this is a, this is a chromatogram. This is what you can get by doing HPLC, high, high uh, HPLC, liquid chromatography. Uh, uh, what you're looking here is fluorescence, and you're looking at the elution time. It's really not very important. Uh, this is the uh, porphyrin uh, chromatogram that you see in an unexposed profile, somebody who did not or was not exposed to, to mercury or background levels of mercury. I'm not sure there's anybody who's not exposed to it. And this is a mercury profile of somebody who was exposed to, to mercury. And you, you can see that there's a couple of peaks. And again, it's not important, again, what, what they are, but you can see that there's a, a, the copro porphyrin is significantly higher uh, on this side in the mercury profile. You also pick up some new uh, peaks, the keto isocoproporphyrin, which is shown here. Uh, other than that, everything looks the same. Now, the urinary porphyrin profile changes uh, in response to mercury exposure was uh, studied by uh, Diane Echeverria and uh, a Woods uh, group uh, out in the University of Washington, as I mentioned. Uh, this is the, the normal way that uh, the corporporphyrin is being metabolized. What, what usually happens is that the 5CP goes into 4CP. That converts into 2CP, which binds to iron to form uh, the heme. What they've been able to show is that mercury uh, can inhibit the enzyme that converts 5-CP to 4-CP, UROD. And that favors the production of DICP and KICP. So the urinary porphyrin profile are, are inherent to responses to mercury exposure, both in animals and in human subjects. And they've also been able to show that polymorphisms in CPOX4 which is the enzyme that converts 5-CP to DICP. Uh, that polymorphisms in this enzyme or, or in this gene that encodes heme biosynthesis pathway uh, modifies the effect of mercury exposure on urinary porphyrin excretion in humans. CPOX preferentially, uh, as I said, converts uh, 5-CP to KICP, which is shown here, and by partially inhibiting uh, mercury, or by partially inhibiting this enzyme uh, with mercury, as I mentioned before, 5-CP uh, tends to accumulate because it cannot go from 5-CP to 4-CP. 
uh, accounting for excess KICP because you're just shifting the reaction from 5CP this way instead of going from 5CP to, to 4CP. The potential consequences of these polymorphisms uh, uh, in relationship with the neurobehavioral uh, performance uh, were studied in uh, dentists, male dentists, DDs, and female dental assistants uh, occupationally exposed to mercury for an average of 19 and uh, 10 years respectively. Their respective uh, mean urinary mercury levels in these individuals is not much higher than in the background population, maybe uh, twofold higher. And the frequency of the polymorphisms in this gene, CPOX4, are shown here. Uh, the, het the homozygous common AA, the heterozygous AC, and the homozygous uh, polymorphic, which is CC, were 75, 23, and 2 percent for the, the male dentists, and 73, 25, and 2 percent for the dental assistants, respectively. And uh, again, without going into too many details, if you look at the interaction uh, between behavioral tests in both the dentists and the, their assistants, you find that on a number of tests there is a significant interaction both with urinary mercury and in the polymorphic type of uh, allele that's expressed in these, uh, in these individuals. So there's a significant association with mercury, urinary mercury, uh, was found for nine and eight measures among dental, the dentists and their assistants, respectively. Uh, CPOX status was associated with four measures in the, the dentist and five measures in their assistants. In both groups, there was an additive effect of urinary mercury and the CPOX polymorphism. Uh, not in all the tests, but in the number of these tests. And uh, the conclusion from this study uh, was that CPOX polymorphism may affect susceptibility for specific neurobehavioral functions associated with mercury uh, exposure. Now I'm going to conclude. Uh, I have a couple more slides. I know I'm running a little bit late. Uh, I think these are the research needs that, that one needs to consider. Uh, I mentioned this before, or maybe not. Uh, yeah, I did. Studies of amalgam toxicity have assumed that the only significant pathway of exposure is via the ingestion or inhalation of mercury vapor from the surfaces of the fillings. Uh, we have a lot of fish eating populations, and as I mentioned before, we have no idea on the interaction between the two. We also have no idea about the interaction between mercury and lead, mercury and manganese. Uh, these are very hard studies to do, and the funding agency are pretty reluctant to fund somebody to study two or three metals. Uh, uh, when it's difficult to find funding or, or get funding for studying even one. Uh, this is actually a study that is not in, uh, in press, well, it's, it's in press, but you haven't seen it yet. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been recently done, and I think it's some interesting data that, that's very pertinent to, to uh, what you're doing, and it shows that actually mercury can migrate from the side of the, from the amalgam. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the tooth. Uh, this was done by, uh, by Zane's spectroscopy, which is, uh, which is a very fancy technique, which allows you to hone in and focus on uh, using fluorescent techniques on, on and identify different metals. So, in this case, uh, this was done looking at calcium, zinc, and mercury. Uh, from reading the paper, it's my understanding that this is actually where the amalgam was placed. And these are the Zanes data for, for different compounds. What you can see is that the mercury is localized within the cavity or within the amalgam, as you'd expect. But there is also accumulation of mercury uh, in, in the calculus. And what these authors have suggested, this is Hugh et al., is that the, it's very likely that the methylmercury or, or the inorganic mercury that's placed within the tooth actually may find its way uh, from the tooth into the bloodstream of the pulp and then uh, into the, the calculus and then move from there uh, into the system, systemic uh, circulation. So uh, I think we've known uh, before that mercury is not inert. It does not stay necessarily uh, in, in the amalgam. We've known that it can evaporate, but I think these are the first studies that now show 
that actually mercury can even move within the tooth into the pulp and into the, the calculus and, and possibly into the bloodstream. There's no information that's available on the additive effects of exposure from amalgams and, and fish consumption. There are no systematic studies on the effects of a maternal amalgam derived mercury on fetal development, as far as I know. A few, if any, uh, studies have been performed or well performed to study the role of polymorphisms uh, in mercury toxicity and the potential for the existence of sensitive uh, subpopulations. Uh, and there are no long-term effects uh, in children. I described the Bellinger study. Uh, I think what we need uh, is some more randomized and blinded studies in dental professionals. Many of the studies that have been done up till now are not blinded and they're not randomized. And until we do all these studies, uh, you know, there's always going to be uh, questions. So uh, these are the research needs. And I'd like to finish by acknowledging uh, the people who helped me over the last few years in my research on, on mercury. Uh, these are the names, I won't go through them. And the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, as I mentioned before, who funds my studies on, on methylmercury. Thanks for your attention and sorry for running a couple minutes late.